Today's presenter is LucidWorks Senior Solutions Engineer, Ted Sullivan. Thank you for joining us today, Ted. Thanks. So what I'd like to talk about today is uh, natural language processing in solar, including some new techniques that I've been working on. Now, some of you may have attended my recent talk at Lucene Solar Revolution in Austin, uh, so thanks. I'll try to put a slightly different spin on this topic today, so hopefully it won't seem too repetitive with my revolution spiel if you caught that live or on Memorex. Sorry, I'm old. I mean, slide share. But I will repeat the offer that I made in Austin. If you have any questions about this talk, feel free to email me either at LucidWorks or via LinkedIn. Love to get some feedback on this. So the basic goal of all this work is to make search smarter by making it more responsive to how we think and communicate with search applications. I'm not the first to pick up this banner, and I won't be the last. It's a hard problem. Most of you will have heard some of this anyway, which generally comes under the rubric of semantic search. But in my opinion, search engines, and solar is no exception, need some translation help to understand what we mean based on what we say. So what I want to do is to outline a vision of some ways to make this dialogue between user and machine more semantically grounded. It starts with the recognition that ambiguity in language is everywhere, but that in language, we have ways to make things more precise. And when we do so, we expect the search engine to respond correctly. Unfortunately, search engines sometimes don't do what we expect, and this can be frustrating and disruptive to good search. I think that a better understanding of the mechanics of language is important here, so I'll spend some time on why I think this. Mechanisms are easier to map to code than concepts. I also want to touch on what we mean by relevance word that's too often used in the abstract, which doesn't work well at implementation time where abstractions need to be translated to precise machine instructions. So what exactly do we mean by relevant? A new book from Manning, coming soon from an online retailer near you by Doug Turnbull and John Berryman, addresses just this question. So you can literally write a whole book on this subject. It's that important. Needless to say, I won't be able to talk about this in the breadth and depth that Doug and John do, but I did want to say how pleased I was to see this word pop up in so many talks at Revolution this year. Obviously, I'm not the only one that feels strongly about this topic, so I want to keep the banner moving forward here if I can. Now I'd like to introduce today's keyword, context, the spin I was talking about earlier. I found that centering on this word helped me to conceptually organize what I'm going to talk about, but more importantly, it gets to the essence of the search quality problem. So why does context matter? Basically, because what is correct or relevant is based on context, both within the language of the query and the documents, and expressed by the user's search agenda, among other things. So this is my agenda slide. Specifically, I'll talk about some recent advances in the query auto filtering technique that do more to resolve phrase ambiguities by resolving semantic context. The original version of query auto filtering enabled noun phrases to be plucked from a query stream and mapped to fields in the index. That turned out to be pretty powerful on its own, but left some semantic problems unresolved. It turns out that some of the reasons for this are linguistic ones. Some others, yes, yeah, true, are bugs that I'm working to fix. The linguistic issues can be addressed, some of them can be addressed by adding what I call verb preposition disambiguation rules. I have a recent blog on this if you want to drill in beyond what I can get to in this talk. I'll also talk about traditional techniques that use contextual information to provide discovery, faceting, and type ahead, which are all familiar, which are essential to fostering a productive search dialogue. And then I'll talk about how these can be used in creative ways at index time rather than query time, to enhance the search conversation by driving what I call context-based relevance. Typically, I'll show some techniques I'm developing to use facets prior to the user's first query by building contextual information into query suggestions, pivot faceting to generate semantically rich suggestions, and standard faceting to add metadata context to the suggestion. I'll then talk about two use cases where this can come in handy, security trimming of suggestions 
and what I call dynamic predictive analysis, which is injecting the context we get from faceting when we build a suggestion index on the raw query suggestions into the user session. Help us infer what their search agenda is and then to adjust the relevance based on what they had previously looked, looked for in the same session. I just, I'm pretty excited about this one. I hope you, you will too. So getting back to the theme word here, why does context matter? Well, because relevance is contextual. Context is all about relationships. Note that the root of the words relevance and relative is the same. That's not an accident. Two people that ask the same question may judge relevance differently depending on what they want to find, their business role, what they already know, and so on. Relevance is relative to a particular conceptual frame of reference. Borrowing from Einstein always makes me feel smarter. You've probably heard this kind of spiel before. A lot of hand-waving has been done, some by yours truly, but what does this really mean in terms of implementing these things? Hopefully, I'll get to some solutions. But first, I need to keep going on the theory for, for a bit. Sorry, it's how I roll, but I'll try to get through these quickly so we can get to the fun stuff. So let's talk about context, what it is, how we can get it, and finally how we can use it to improve search. This slide is about different types of context that we encounter. Semantic, user points of view or search agendas, which are dynamic, as we'll see, and social and business contexts, which look at relationships between users, organizations, and data. Nothing really new here, and probably some things that I left out, but this is my scope slide, so to speak. One example of user context mining in our LucidWorks Fusion product is the stuff we are doing with signals, signal aggregation, and recommendation. We have recently added an event miner tool that builds and analyzes graphs of user search session behaviors. Once you have this type of context, you can start to relate the current user behavior to patterns that have been mined and aggregated to get the, this is what other users that did what you are doing now also did context. So when we look at this problem at the data science level, we see that we store information as sets of metadata objects and that there are relationships both within and between these objects, the so-called where clauses and joins in relational database terminology, respectively. The query is one such metadata object. The set of documents returned by the search engine are also metadata objects, and context covers both the intra and interrelationship between these objects. So search, as it turns out, is basically exchanging a query metadata object for a set of result metadata objects. Things are also related to other things, and again, it is these relationships themselves that is this context thing that I'm focusing on. Reminds me of conversations that I used to have with my wife. Uh, where's the whisking thing? Uh, it's in the storage thing next to the other thing. Things are important, even in real life. This slide makes the point that ferreting out these relationships can take a little data crunching, or a lot. We can encode known relationships in a knowledge graph, like an ontology, we can also mine these relationships from unstructured text in a number of ways, traditional NLP techniques like parts of speech, clustering, machine learning, and so on. Again, nothing really new here, but I wanted to outline some of our technological baselines. I'll say a little bit more about the mining of knowledge graphs for discovering connectedness patterns, but mining is a common theme. Whether we start with highly structured data or data that is linguistically structured, but thought of as unstructured when it's just dumped into a metadata field. What we are doing is looking for co-occurrences, that is, correlations between data elements either within or between metadata objects. The kicker here is that we can then surface these discovered relationships in search, basically by making the search engine aware of these contexts that we have discovered. Now we're getting somewhere, moving from how we get it to how we use it. One way to think of these elements embedded within our data, as shown at the bottom, are as feature vec features of the data. Machine learning talks about feature vectors. Vector means that we want to quantify these things. An example is the term frequency over inverse document frequency scoring me measure, that we, which is a type of vector called a term vector. Uh, vectors can also be represented or mapped to human understandable terms, and this is a very important point that I want to highlight later. 
So some of the features that we find are more salient than others, and these are the ones that we want to find. I think that a little example here may help illustrate what I'm talking about. Let's consider the token Apple. This word, as we know, has a number of different contexts. That is, out of context, the word is ambiguous. However, if we associate it with the tokens Tim Cook, we glimpse one context. Times Square gives us a window into another. Granny Smith, yet a third. And White Album, a fourth. These terms on the right are the features that we look for. Now if we add more words or phrases that tend to co-occur, first set, the context of the first set is clearly the company Apple Computer. Second one is New York City, also known as the Big Apple. The third set is talking about apples per se, that is the fruit. And the fourth, about the record label that the Beatles founded so they could earn more money from their work and have more creative control, I guess. I think more money was the most, the most important thing for them. An interesting term in these lists is Macintosh. It's both a variety of Apple and a model made by Apple Computer. This shows that these feature sets can overlap, so we need to build confidence that we are talking about one of these things by aggregating features. The more co-occurrences we have with a feature set, the more confident we are that it belongs there. Steve Jobs, for example, has other contexts like Pixar, for example. He had two companies that he, that he was in charge of, both huge. Another interesting point to be made about the word Macintosh is a linguistic one. When speaking about the computer, we say Apple Macintosh or Apple's Macintosh using the possessive. When speaking about the fruit, we say Macintosh apples, where S is in the plural form. Note the inversion of word order here, which is significant. We don't mix them in the same context. So it's another clue as to which one we're dealing with. There is also a minor spelling difference, which may be picked up by fuzzy search. Note, Macintosh, the computer, is spelled M-A-C, whereas Macintosh, the Apple, is spelled without the A. But we probably want to ignore that, because many people may not even be aware of it. The word order thing is an example of a noun-noun phrase. More on this later. But it makes the point that we can't always ignore word order. Sometimes it carries meaning. This is why we make exact match rank higher than sloppy matches when using solar, the solar e dismax parser, and this helps tune relevance or goodness, but may not help with precision or correctness. I have some other examples in this later in the talk as it pertains to the query order filtering technique. Macintosh is also a person's family name, so the context could be totally different. A bio of celebrity chef Angus Macintosh, or the original Macintosh guy that developed and planted this variety of apple. Another point here is that documents are usually about more than one thing. So you could be talking about both Apple Computer and New York City, say when talking about that very cool Apple store in Midtown Manhattan, or you could be talking about both Apple Computer and Apple Records when discussing the trademark lo lawsuit between these companies or the rapprochement with, that led to our being able to buy Beatles songs from iTunes. So feature sets can overlap. And sometimes this is meaningful, sometimes it isn't. Okay, the last of the theory slides, but also a segue into how this theory fits with the techniques I want to talk about today. This slide talks about two levels of semantic context. The level where we look at basic linguistic components, words or tokens and phrases, which should be treated as single entities or features, I won't say much about autophrasing here, just to say that the code has recently been enhanced by a fellow named Karash, whom I met at Revolution this year from Synapsis.com. Karash has recently uploaded a new JIRA patch that promises better performance and fixes some bugs, too, that affect phrase highlighting. And autophrasing is significant because it helps identify phrases that are really single things and works well with unstructured text because it is implemented as a Lucene token filter so you can put it in a standard solar a Lucene analyzer chain. The next level starts to get us into NLP stuff, resolving ambiguities in subject verb object statements. This is where the user can add more semantic context to a query that does not directly map the field value data. Now, in addition to traditional means of getting at this level, I've added some configuration rules to the query order filter that can resolve some of these issues. So here's a case where linguistic me mechanisms start to meet search mechanisms. 
as I will show, we can do some pretty cool resolutions with these tricks up our sleeve. Again, the concept of noun noun phrases will be revisited now at the implementation level. Okay, enough theory already. But first, I want to introduce some sample data sets that I've been working with to help illustrate some of this in actual search applications. The first one is a music ontology that I've been working on. It models relationships between compositions, composers, performers, groups, recordings, and so on. To make it searchable in solar, I had to do a flattening or a denormalization operation on this graph. I also did some interesting manipulations on the object model before denormalization that relate to the relationship mining stuff I was talking about. Of particular interest here is the notion of a cover, which is a recording by an artist or group of artists that were not one of the song's composers or lyricists. There was also some work to determine which nodes are highly related by noting when two nodes are connected to the same midpoint node. As a proof of concept, this correctly determined that John Lennon and Paul McCartney are highly correlated, as are Bob Dylan and the band, because they share many connections to other entities, so that is songs, recordings, albums, and so on. Many other examples pop out from this ontology, some more surprising than that. We'll see how we can use this discovered context later, though, in interesting ways. The next domain that I'll talk about is the biomedical or healthcare domain. This knowledge graph snippet shows some of the concepts, diseases, conditions, treatments, etc. Of particular interest for the example I will use is the relationship between drugs and symptoms, which can be caused by, symptoms can be caused by disease processes, but they can also be caused by drugs or drug interactions themselves. We call these things side effects or adverse reactions. So it's very important when investigating a drug to know when it treats some disease or condition versus when it causes it. This particular context can obviously have life-saving and or life-threatening consequences, so it's pretty important. I would also note here that there are a number of comprehensive knowledge bases in this domain paid for by your own tax dollars and therefore free for use from the National Libraries of Medicine, things like the medical subject headings uh, taxonomy or thesaurus called MESH, the NCI thesaurus, uh, data sets like SNOMED, and so on. So there's a lot of Pre, uh, there's a lot of knowledge graphs out there that you can use if this is your uh, domain of interest. Of course, it's all of, all of our domain of interest because we have to worry about our own health, as I'll show later. To get started on this query of filtering uh, enhancements, I've added a new feature to the auto filter that I refer to here as verb preposition context rules or verb disambiguation. So to get to the example, what happens when a user tries to constrain a query using natural language constructs, constructs sorry, that have subject, verb, object structures, where the object is either explicit or implicit, meaning any? Here are two examples from the music domain, songs Eric Clapton wrote versus songs Eric Clapton performed. Note that in the music ontology, a song can either be a composition or a performance recording of that song. Since the verbs wrote and performed, are not values in the index, they would be ignored by the auto filter unless we give it some help. And you can see that in the first uh, query. You get, uh, it shows both performer and composer independent of whether you say wrote or performed. But the user is attempting to constrain the results by making their query more precise. However, the basic logic of the query auto filter just picks out the field values, in this case the nouns, but doesn't know what to do with the verbs, so it leaves them alone. It also, by design, covers all the bases that it knows about, so we get an or query that would be as if the user had just typed in Eric Clapton songs, because that's all it's really looking at at this point, where the ambiguity in the query would fit with the ambiguity of the response. And it's okay to do both if you just say Eric Clapton songs. For example, we think of it songs as Elvis Presley songs, even though he didn't write or co-write most of his signature hits, but we still think of songs like Hound Dog or Heartbreak Hotel as Elvis Presley songs. But when we say songs Elvis Presley wrote, our intent is much more specific. So, if we had a way to tell the auto filter that the verbs mean that the user wants to constrain the query to specific fields, in other words, narrow the context where wrote, written, 
or composed means use the composer field, and verbs like performed, recorded, or sang mean use the performer field, we get the answers that the user expects, as shown here by the auto filter output query. Uh, don't have a demo on this, this exact one, but I will have some search values later so that you can verify that this actually works. And when do we do this? Well, perusing the, perusing the query logs will hopefully tell us when users are trying to do this kind of constraint on their queries by using other context information to try to narrow the query down. We can also, as shown later, give them hints that they can do this to their queries by uh, actually making type of queries that have this rich uh, semanticness to them that the user, that the example here shows. Here's another example that shows the bi-directional nature of these rules. In the first one, the uh, bands that Eric Clapton was in, without verb disambiguation, the query auto filter creates a query which has all the logical permutations, see that in the middle, of the noun phrases band and Eric Clapton mapped to all the fields these terms occur in. If we add the configuration that maps various ways, okay, and to, uh, if we have the configuration that maps various ways to say was in the group member or member of group, depending on whether the target noun is the group or the member, we get the second most, much simpler query substitution. It turns out that in this case, the only logical permutation that works in the data set is the one that we're looking for. So we get the same response in both cases. And I'll show you the response here. This is where the filtering by the auto filter is supplemented by the natural filtering of the data set. Some luck here, but one good thing is that our new query, shown at the bottom, is simpler than the other one and therefore more efficient. It's a minor win, though, not, not really earth shattering. Here we use the same disambiguation rule but get much more dramatic results. The query is who's in the who. One interesting point about this query is that it's composed entirely of nose, noise words or stop words. I could have also chosen who's in the the because there is a band or was a band called the the, but most people don't know about them. Oh, right. That was also a band that Van Morrison started his career in. Uh, them recorded the hit song Gloria or G-L-O-R-I-A if you want some context for who them was. Anyway, because the who is a known noun phrase to the ontology collection, the query auto filter gets a lot of stuff without this ambiguation. The band entity, members, the songs, the albums, because all of these have the metadata value, the who, in at least one field. Okay. When we add the disambiguation rule, we just get four records for the four members, John, Roger, Keith, and Pete. When I got this query to work, I was pumping fist and had to blast, we won't get fooled again and go and mobile on my iPhone. I mean, I was pretty psyched when I saw this working. The next example shows the generality of this by looking at another domain, healthcare. One particularly ornery problem in this area, as I was talking about earlier, that many of us deal with every day are drugs. What are they good for? And also, what problems do they cause? A drug entity will have relationships for has indication, what conditions it is proved for, and has side effects, issues that it can cause. Without verb support, the query for the drug name would return both things, which might be confusing to users. As I'll show in a bit, they really shouldn't, though, if our search is linguistically attuned to this domain. But what if the user explicitly asks about side effects? That can happen if you are trying to figure out why you're feeling crappy. Maybe it's a drug that you're taking. This is where verb disambiguation can help. Now the query shown at the bottom is focused on what drugs have a certain condition in the side effect, has side effect field. Here's another interesting linguistic phenomenon. It also explores the metadata that are built into the music collection that distinguishes a cover from an original performance which is defined as a performance that includes at least one of the song's composers. But if I say Beatles songs covered, it means something different from songs Beatles covered, because Beatles songs is one set of things. 
Original songs by the Beatles. This is an, another example of a noun noun phrase. Subject verb object parsing of the first is subject Beatles songs, verb covered, and the object is implied. Anyone other than the Beatles. Obviously, if they recorded it, it's an original, it's not a cover. Whereas in the second, the subject noun is songs, the verb is covered again, and the object noun is Beatles. At the bottom, I show a rule that disambiguates these, which is a bit more complex than the other one. So I really don't have to drill into it now. But if you're interested, a discussion is included in my latest blog post. Note that there is a special context here. The pattern transformation is only done if the verb covered is encountered because, as discussed before, Beatles songs by itself includes both songs that they wrote and songs they perform, covers or not. This is why the rule includes the filter version S equals cover. If I highlight the noun noun phrases in this uh, slide, Beatles songs, Robert Johnson songs, they are clapped and covered. One of my favorites is uh, Crossroads, which is that great cream song that many of you may know, which is a Robert Johnson song was, who was one of the greatest blues composers who ever lived. And the final one at the bottom uh, is an example from the drugs domain. That is, if we say insomnia drugs, we mean drugs that treat insomnia, not that cause it, but just treat it. So we can use this method of disambiguation in the drug ontology example too with the pattern disease or condition followed by the word drugs means use the has indication field only. Therefore, the default for this kind of search should be to show that what drugs are good for, but only show the drugs that cause a condition if the user explicitly asks for that by using the verbs. This also underscores the fact that even these rules can be situation or domain dependent, and such is the nature of language, unfortunately. So how many of these rules do we need? Fortunately, the query order filter and the collection data structure uh, just the, you know, the laws of probability or existence does a lot by itself, even if by serendipity, as the previous example showed. So hopefully, these rules would be more in line of tweaks that can be added to improve position, but we'll see. This is a fairly new technique that hasn't been used much yet. What can we do? What we can also do, however, is to steer users to queries that we have honed like this one to give them a sense of what we can support. And this is where type ahead comes in. So getting back to our keyword of the day, context, facets are one of the main tools that we currently have to display context. Facet essentially contains the complete set of values for a given field for a given set of documents. This enables us to visualize contextual relationships within our response set. Currently, we use this context for discovery post-query. As I'll show in a bit, we can also use it to build context into another form of discovery which operates pre-query, type ahead or query suggestion. Also, there is the good, the bad, and the ugly aspects of facets. Let's see if I can inject some background music here. The ugly is when we have poor precision. I love Clint Eastwood movies, don't you? The ugly is when we have poor precision or noise hits in our response set. We can use relevance tuning to get these off of the first few pages, but we can't remove them from the facet because the facet engine looks at all the hits, good, bad, or ugly. But although having embarrassing facets is bad in production, it is also an opportunity for QA. In other words, it's a great way to hone in on these problems because you can see them in the facet output. Search, uh, as an aside, is really a great tool for data quality assessment, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later. I also wanted to highlight some of the really cool advances that we as a solar community are making with faceting and solar. Uh, at Revolution, in the closing committer session, facets were one of the hottest things that were featured and voted on by the committers, and rightly so. And Hossman and his colleagues are doing some very cool things with stats that can power dynamic business intelligence where the cubes or dashboards are driven by user queries and not by DBA uh, you know, SQL scripts. Heat maps is another one, which are really cool. And the other one I've uh, highlighted here are more flexible APIs. Uh, Yannick Seeley's, uh, who was one of the originated, worked on uh, the original FACET implementation in solar. Uh, Yannick's work on the JSON FACET API, for example. Uh, there's still some issues there, 
but it's something that will really help search integration efforts. So uh, bravo, Yannick, good work. And to shameless, and now to shamelessly steal a tagline from Monty Python's John Cleese, and now for something completely different, using the power of FASTIT to improve pre-query discovery or type ahead. The basic rationale here is that since we can handle more precise queries with more precise responses, we would like the users to enjoy these benefits. So we want to build suggestions that show the users what types of natural language questions they can ask. We want to build suggestions where we leverage all this great context stuff. The idea then is to create a solar collection that is used only for query suggestion. Now this is not a new idea, and it's a really good way to bring in lots of search mechanisms like relevance tuning, popularity, recommendation, and so on into type ahead. What I've added here is some interesting twists to get both semantic and facet-based context into this collection. So this slide shows the two main components of the suggestor builder framework that I'm working on, query collectors or fetchers and the suggestor builder. Query collector is an interface that collects a list of suggestions and then submits them to the suggestor builder. Some possible implementations are listed. Uh, suggestions can be acquired from query logs, files such as curated lists by subject matter experts, databases, and from solar term fields, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's a simple interface, but there's many more possibilities. I'm highlighting here the pivot facet collector implementation because this is where we can build semantic context into, into the suggestion. You can also do this kind of thing that I'll show you in a minute with databases where structured queries can be used to combine columns in some, into semantically meaningful phrases. Remember that term, semantically meaningful phrases. The suggestor builder has three main functions. Using the target collection, it validates the queries, makes sure they work, in other words, and this is important if the, if the tokens don't come from the search index, like, like a curated list of, by subject matter experts, for example. It also gathers context metadata using facet queries and submits the complete uh, compiled suggestion, now really records with metadata to Solar to create the suggestor collection. Returning to the thing thing, we can think of fields or columns in structured data as properties or attributes of a thing represented by a collection record or a database row. Some of these are noun properties, name, label, type, title, and others adjective properties, size, color, location. We can combine these in many ways, only some of which makes sense to us in human speak, that is. This exposes the within object relationships that I was talking about earlier. An example may help. If we have people data with fields like first name, last name, occupation, city, and state, we would tend to think of these in that order or a similar one so that an example row might be rendered as Bob Jones, accountant, Cincinnati, Ohio. But we wouldn't conceptualize this row as Ohio, accountant, Jones, Cincinnati, Bob, even though this is, would be one of the permutations if we were trying to generate these phrases automatically, as it were. If we want to create more precise user-friendly suggestions for multiple fields, we need to give the machine some help. Also, we may not want every possible permutation of all these fields as the suggestion index would get very, very large and hopefully and maybe unwieldy and not usable. So here are some examples of what I'm talking about from the music data set. The templates, or the pivot template patterns, include the field names wrapped with special characters and other text. Note the S appended to some fields, like musician type, recording type, with an S at the end. So if the user gets the plural form of the value, it's a result set after not a single, and you're usually after more general uh, pivot facet, uh, sorry, uh, suggestions than specific ones, because then the index doesn't get bloated too far. The code, when we do this, strips out the field names from the markup patterns, builds a pivot facet query, executes it against the target collection where all the content is, and then recursively drills through the results to construct all the possible permutations of these patterns that are actually in the index data. And then it, then it pokes the values that get back from the pivot facet query back into the template field slots to create suggestions. As I said, you can also imagine doing something like this with a structured database SQL or key value stores like Mongo or Couchbase would work just fine. Sample results that we get back from the music ontology are shown below. These queries are obviously well suited to query out of filtering. 
So we now can suggest precise queries that we also can precisely respond to. Uh, I see the one at the bottom, Beatles songs covered by Joe Cocker. Again, that's a type of noun phrase when, where you have an actual verb in it that we can now resolve. But using facets, we can go one step further. The suggester builder first functions are to validate, I was talking about, to see if the query works, and contextualize the query suggestion. It does this by submitting the query to, actually submitting the query to the target collection and getting back facet information. This facet data is then copied to the query suggestion record to build a record that is indexed into the suggester index, which is a step three. So going back to our music example, if we submit the song titled Stuck Inside a Mobile with the Memphis Blues again, we get the context information like A, it's a song, B, it was written by Bob Dylan, and C, that it's classified both as blues rock and folk rock. Other metadata is possible here. I just showed these three important ones for, for uh, fit on the slide mostly. And maybe some of the relationship data that we mined earlier from our ontology could also be used here, related artists and so on. This metadata is now attached to this query string and can then be returned by our type ahead implementation along with the suggestion that we will display. And then this slide shows two use cases where this added context can really help. The first one, security trimming of suggestions works by copying ACL values from the document collection to the query collection. Facets will automatically dedupe them. So now we can apply the same filter query on the suggestion as we do on the results. The reason for doing this is that with suggestion, you never want to suggest a query that returns zero results. So imagine for a given user, if all the content that would return from a given query is restricted and they don't have any of the permissions, they shouldn't see the query because for them it won't work. It's a false promise. The other type of context that I detailed in the last slide can be used to boost suggestions if the user has a consistent agenda within a session. So it gets to the stuck, if I, so if I get the stuck inside of Memphis song and search it, the system can now know that I'm looking for song titles by Bob Dylan or more generally in the folk rock or blues rock genre. When I search for more songs, I can now boost these properties. Bob Dylan or folk rock songs that would otherwise be buried would now bubble up to the top. And we can do this by caching and then translating the suggestion meta into boost squares in our front end. They we may also want to give these boosts some fade out quality too to boost more recent searches more. Also, the more metadata fields that we use for this, the more chances for natural boosting aggregation as the user moves through the session to get the common themes of the user's current agenda. This is uh, this way of building metadata into the query introspection or query intent generation is very similar to what uh, Simon Hughes of Dice.com and Trey Granger talked about in their really excellent revolution talks this year. And you can see those two on slide share. Um, but anyway, I myself experienced the power of this when I was building the music ontology using Google and Wikipedia. And Google seemed to be doing something like this. If I was searching for songs by a given artist and my agenda stayed constant for a little while, after a few searches, the type head would return a long song title like Stuck Inside of Memphis, that Stuck Inside of Mobile, sorry, like that with two or three key starts. It was like it was reading my mind. As I said at the beginning, it's all about context. Google seemed to know what types of things I was looking for, and after a while it would suggest them to me. And with this technique, we can hopefully create applications with that kind of smarts too. I mean, when I was doing it, it was eerie, and I, so I think this is a really pretty cool idea. And I think that simply adding some context thought to the query suggestion should make this happen, which will absolutely rock, and users will think you're you're a magician. So most of what I've been talking about here requires some good metadata from which we can get context. This is my very brief best practices sermon slide. This isn't my strong suit, though. I'm a scientist, not a preacher. But I did have a comment in one of the JIRA threads for the auto filter where the comment was, well, you need a lot of maintenance to get the query right uh, so that it, the technique is going to be difficult to use. Well, I would kind of disagree with that. 
because the more we rely on structure to deliver precision, which is this is showing you that we can do that, the more we need to focus on data quality. And in my view, the obvious solution to garbage in, garbage out is not to put any garbage in. Obviously, this can often be much easier said than done, but it should be a constant effort to improve results by improving the underlying data. Like any battle with entropy, which is essentially what this is, it's an ongoing effort, and every little bit helps. So I would, I would recommend that you hire more subject matter experts or domain experts and bring them in to help solve your data quality issues before they become search issues. It's like preventive maintenance, more cost effective. And, I was, and I was, as I was talking about earlier, you can actually use the search application itself, especially FASTED, to do a better job of QA by ferreting out these uh, noise hits that make everybody confused and you know, if your CEO sees them, if that's the pet peeve query of your boss, then, you know, you've got some work to do, as Grant was saying in his uh, great uh, keynote speech of revolution. So second, uh, what do we do if we have the so-called unstructured text? I call it the old unstructured versus structured bugaboo. My advice is to try to get some structure. And there are tried and true methods for doing this, whether you believe in the power of taxonomists rules or algorithms. Doing some machine classification as the data is indexed in tech to enhance the context in your collection. The techniques that I'm talking about today could then be used to surface and coordinate all this wonderful work that you do at, at index time. So returning to the query stuff that I started with, if we have a way to build models of data using classification, we can either do it with machines or with people. And to get these feature sets that I was talking about by mapping the text to the features that is in it. The truth, however, is that machine, this machine learning route also needs subject matter expertise to build these training sets. And then the machine takes over to essentially amplify these seed crystals created by the SMEs. So there is some manual effort required for both methods. There is also what are called rules-based classifiers that require a heavy investment in subject matter expertise, and they work in a similar fashion to the query auto-filter auto disambiguation rules I was describing. Most of the vendors in this space, like SmartLogic, Temis, and Basis Technologies, use some rule-based classification to do what they do. The rules are often domain-specific for some of the linguistic reasons that I talked about earlier. The, insomnia drugs versus Beatles songs, both noun phrases, but one, the default should be to use the uh, short form and the other it shouldn't be, things like that. I also like when you, machine learning approaches are used to feedback onto ontologies. If you look at Thomson Reuters Open Calais, which uses one of the original granddaddies of the classification engines, Clearforce, they bought them about 10 years ago, I think, the, the Thomson Reuters has built a massive ontology over time. And presumably, the uh, machine learning stuff would have a lot of work to do with it. Same could be said of Watson, where a lot of the uh, Watson's knowledge base that it uses used it on Jeopardy stage was built by machine learning and other types of technologies to crunch huge amounts of text. And so presumably, in both these cases, there was some curation applied. Um, at least some use, at least they use the SME configuration to weed out some of the stupid stuff that machines sometimes generate. I remember a while back when I was working with Clearforce, they may have fixed this by now, the Clearforce uh, entity extractor thought that Lincoln Junior High School was a person because it had a, a last name Lincoln and presumably Junior was also a cue that it was a person. So most of these uh, techniques, machine techniques, have an uh, accuracy of about 90%, 95% when they're highly tuned and so on. And the 5% of stuff you can, hopefully you can use to me. So mostly machine, some uh, subject matter experts. So don't, you know, throw those guys out of a job, you still need them. Uh, but hopefully you can scale out with the machine learning stuff and then use uh, subject matter expertise when you need it. So the third panel shows the basic process here. If we can derive feature sets from both the documents at index time and the query, we can do an intersection using boosting. And this is kind of what Simon and Trey were talking about in their talks as well. And this can be used to augment the native relevance mechanisms such as TFIDF. The key here is to get a set of features from the query 
that we can intersect with features in the data set. And to do this, we need to detect the features in the query or map the terms in the query to some set of features. Now, one thing to note is that the query usually has many fewer tokens to work with than the documents that we're searching on. And the fact that it has just less verbiage to, to go on can preclude or restrict the effectiveness of certain techniques that are being, that from being, having them used at query time, for example. They're still great at index time, but they kind of fall short of query time because there's just not enough text for them to get their teeth into, if you will. Note that the core Lucene solar relevance mechanisms can only work with what's in the query, the tokens that are in the query. Obviously, synonyms give us a little extra reach on this. But by using these other features that we've discovered, we can add indirect or aboutness measures to the direct relevance that solar computes from the query. And as I said, a lot of implementations are using these knowledge graphs to basically build boosting queries to help the native relevance work better. But this will all work as long as we can tie all of these things together from what the user enters into our little search box. So now I come to the proposal or Kool-Aid slide, as I would call it. So if we get the metadata structure into our document index through the, whatever technique we choose, document classification stages like ML, manual, ontology, or some hybrid, we and we can translate or map the values that we get out of these, uh, you know, the tags, so to speak, that we get out of these to human speak, that is, put them in language that we understand. We can then use the query auto filtering technique sort of as a normalization layer. This way, we can mix and match classification techniques using knowledge bases or rules based classification where that makes sense and machine learning tools where it doesn't. And we can think of this. So here's the, sorry, I should have advanced the slide there. So we basically can use the query auto filtering to fill in the gap between the query, which it's very good, very adept at pulling out uh, stuff from, and the index once we've made it more structured by all these techniques. And we do this by thinking of the model that I've been talking about as the Lucene Solar Index itself. This has multiple benefits for stat facets and now auto filtering. And also, this is where our LucidWorks Fusion product comes in. It has pre-processing pipelines that work both at index and query time. And these are modular or component-based. So it fit, fits the synthesis very nicely. We can mix and match stuff in a LucidWorks Fusion pipeline, for example. And uh, we will also be adding many of the components that I've talked about, or may already have some of them, uh, both machine learning and NLP approaches like parts of speech. And we, as I said, we also have signal aggregation and recommendation event mining, and hopefully uh, sometime more robust suggestion, as I've been talking about. So if you haven't done let, downloaded the latest version of Fusion, please do so. I'm proud to say that it's a very cool platform, and it's getting better with every release. So that's it for the talk. Um, thanks for your attention, and I'll look forward to your questions either now or online. Thank you, Ted. We will now begin the Q&A portion of the session. If you have questions, you can answer them into the chat window on the bottom left of your screen. And if we don't have time to get to your question today, someone from the LucidWorks team will reach out to you. So the first question that we have for you, Ted, is which version of Solar has these features? Uh, if you're talking about the query auto filter, uh, both the, the latest version on, on JIRA and also GitHub works in Solar 5. Uh, the current version is compiled against the trunk. Uh, I should note that if you're running Solar 4, you will need to get the Solar 4 version and the same thing with Solar 5 because there were some API changes um, in the core Lucene, uh, actually in the field cache, it became more restricted to use in, in Solar 5. So there had to be some code changes for that. So you need to get the appropriate version to run query auto filtering in uh, Solar 5, but there are versions for both. If you're talking about the uh, pivot fastening stuff, that stuff is not yet out on GitHub. I'll have that out soon, but it'll be a Java main that you can use to build some of these things. And it should work with either version because it's using SolarJ to formulate the queries and build a suggester collection. Thank you. 
The next question is from one of your examples. From a free form text field to enter a search criteria, how would you detect that Eric Clapp is a composer or a singer? Okay, so the way it basically works is that the phrase Eric Clapton is a value, once I denormalize the, the uh, ontology into a collection, is a value of or both records that are songs composed by him or, or recorded. So the, the schema has fields like has composer, has uh, performer, and the ontology denormalization code maps the value Eric Clapton as values in those fields. And the way the query of filter works is it basically builds a map of all the field values in string fields to the string fields that they came from. So the query auto filter processing code then goes through the string songs Eric Clapton wrote, it sees the token songs, it checks its uh, FST map and finds that songs is the value in a field song, actually singular, but there's stemming involved too. Song is a value in the uh, composition type and recording type field. It finds that the phrase Eric Clapton is a value in the performer and the recording, uh, sorry, the performer and the composer fields. It's all, Eric Clapton is also a, a value in the member of group field. Uh, so that's how we do the bands Eric Clapton was in. So basically the idea is the phrase Eric Clapton occurs in multiple places as values within string, solar, uh, lucene string indexed fields. And the query filter just maps those back to the fields that they came from. So as, you, as the question suggests, it can take a free text query like that and automatically, this is why it's called auto filtering, can automatically turn it into a structured query without your having to do anything else. You just plug it in and it works against the its string fields that you have in your collection. Thank you. The next question is similar, but I'm not sure if the answer is the same, so I will ask you. How is it possible to auto-filter documents based on the query? For example, if someone types this weekend and that phrase triggers a query to only return documents where a date is this weekend? Um, well, in order for the query auto-filter to work, you would have to have that phrase this weekend in your uh, in your document set. And you can do this in various ways in updating, you know, like when, when will this happen this weekend. But that would require quite a lot of updates on your index, but that would be how you would have to do it. Another, another way you could do that is without the query, and I'm focusing on the query auto filter here because that's the technique that I've been developing, but you certainly could use other techniques. Uh, the, basic, the basic thing we're talking about here is trying to figure out what the user intent is. So maybe in that case, if you didn't have that metadata, you might use another technique like uh, just natural language processing parts of speech, or you could even say, uh, you could even do it in Fusion using what we call a, you know, basically a, a landing page or boost query, say this weekend would turn that into a, basically a range query that says that the, um, it would have to happen between next Saturday and next Sunday, whatever the next Saturday, next Sunday date is. So I'm, I'm fumbling a little bit here, but you could easily do that sort of thing by detecting the phrase in Fusion this weekend and then turning that into a range query, for example. So this would be another way of doing the same thing that I'm talking about, trying to infer the user's intent from what they type in. And auto filtering may not be the best way to do that particular use case. And that's fine because we can apply many different tools to the same problem. And as I was saying earlier in Fusion, we have these query pipelines where we can put lots of these different things together. So if one thing doesn't recognize it and work on it, something else maybe will. I don't know if that answers your question, but it's a good question. It really is because there's just a lot of variety here in terms of you know, this basic problem of what does the user actually want. Thank you. The next question is, how would this approach work with other languages besides English? Okay. 
Well, again, a lot of the examples that I'm talking about are based on grammatical rules in English. Other languages have similar rules, um, have the concept of, you know, for example, in, in, in pictogram-based languages, sometimes the pictogram is a single word, sometimes more than one make up a single word, that kind of thing. Uh, the, lingu the code itself may not translate well to Asian languages. I would have to admit that off the top of my head. But certainly the basic technique of trying to use, get into the linguistics of what the user is asking for and try to see if we can come up with mechanisms for that would be a general one. Although I wouldn't want to promise anything other than, say, Western languages where um, a lot of these concepts also occur besides English. I guess that's a punt. I'll, I'll turn that one to Trey Granger, who's written some really great stuff on language. Um, so you might want to send an email to Trey on that one. Not my... Uh... Okay, thank you. The next question is, does query auto-filtering contain semantic disambiguation? Uh, the current versions use this form of disambiguation where you can basically map verbs or prepositions to uh, to fields to constrain the output query. I would call that, so at least the question is, does it do everything that you can imagine with semantic problems? No, it doesn't. But one of the reasons why I came up with the idea of building suggestions was basically to, to give users a flavor of what kind of questions they can ask and which ones will work. So it, as I said at the beginning of the talk, it's a really hard problem, and there's a lot more work to be done to really make this, make, make this work in all situations. So if the data sets or the type of questions that the user answering or asking and you want to answer fit with this type of technique, can use it. Uh, if not, there may be other things that you need to do, like, for example, traditional techniques like parts of speech recognition and so forth uh, that you can do. So I, it's really an open-ended answer. But it's a good question, um, presume, assuming that we're talking beyond what I'm showing here. Thank you. So this will be our last question. Does Solar recognize and use schema, i.e. schema.org, to recognize entities and relationships? If the answer is yes, how helpful is schema in Solar? Schema.org, was that the question, Aaliyah? Yes, that was in parentheses. Oh, okay. So does well, Solar recognize I'm, I'm not, the schema ID? I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure I'm answering the question. Schema, of course, is something that Solar collections have. Lucene by itself is schemaless. That is, you can keep adding field name field name, field value pairs, and it will keep indexing it. And Solar has added uh, a schema layer on top of Lucene. Uh, there's been some talk of going to a more schemaless data set uh, in Solar. And you can still do that with what are known as dynamic fields. So, uh, but the query filter really doesn't care. If the question is about the query filter, it doesn't really care what's in schema.xml, if that's the question. Because what it's doing is it look, it's looking at the actual Lucene index itself after all of this, all the indexing stuff is done and saying, you know, what fields are string fields. And you can also constrain it by saying only use these or don't use those, for example. But once the data is indexed into Lucene, it can either be what we call a tokenized field or a text field or a non-tokenized field where you have exact max semantics, which is a string field. And the current version of the auto filter basically just looks at the Lucene index and asks it, well, what are all the string fields that you have? And then if you don't tell it anything, it will build one of these inverted maps against everything. And it doesn't need solar. So you can use it whether you're doing dynamic uh, schema or schema-less, if you will, or using a very strict schema.xml definition for all your fields. If that's the question, I'm not sure it is, but uh, that would be my answer if it were. Okay, great. Thank you, Ted. So we're just about out of time. Um, maybe for that person who asked the last question or anyone who um, has any outstanding questions, 
You can always contact us via the contact form at www.lucidworks.com. Um, also, we had a ton of questions we didn't get to. For those of you who asked questions that weren't answered, someone from the LucidWorks team will reach out to you. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, everyone who did register for this webinar will receive an email with a link to the recording once it's available and also a link to the slides. So thanks for joining us and we hope you have a great day. Thanks everybody.